we're invited speakers from all the all, all over the world. You have seen already Patrick from was it uh, Seattle? Yeah, yes, uh, North California, I guess, or somewhere like this. But, but Hui Jing is from Singapore. It's also far, far away. So we're truly international conference, not because we're just speaking English and and, and such. So please welcome. All the way from Singapore. Dobrodin, <clears throat> this is my first time in Russia and I'm very happy for the opportunity to speak to all of you about a topic I'm very passionate about. But before that, just a little bit about myself. My first name is Hui Jing and my family name is Chen. I'm actually from Malaysia and I've played basketball for more than half of my life. It's an interesting story if you want to ask me about this afterwards. And um, it was actually what got me into web development in the first place. Right now, I'm a front-end engineer in Singapore, and I sometimes will write blog posts about CSS. And I also run Talk CSS, which is Singapore's only CSS-centric meetup at the moment. But enough about myself. So today I'm here to talk about you know, Chinese typography on the web. Now, I've come across many definitions of typography over the years, and I've personally settled on this one by Gerrit Noje, that typography is writing with prefabricated letters. Letters are the building blocks of a writing system, regardless of language. And if you think about it, almost every writing system in the world today seems to be alphabetic. But Chinese is different. Chinese is currently the only logographic writing system left that is widely used by millions of people. Each Chinese character is composed within a uniform square, allowing Chinese to be read efficiently regardless of whether it's set horizontally or vertically. And until proven otherwise, it seems that Chinese was an indigenous invention developed separately from the proto sinaitic scripts, which were the origins of alphabetic languages. And we can see how the nature of Western languages in Europe differ from the Eastern languages in Asia. The Phoenician alphabet is considered the origin of many alphabetic writing systems on which the Greek and later the Latin and Cyrillic alphabets were based on. And for such languages, letters are combined to form all the different words you would use to communicate with another person. With Chinese characters, we have thousands upon thousands of unique glyphs that can express meaning on their own or be used in combination with other glyphs. And this has a direct consequence on the structure of the languages themselves. So, for example, hippopotamus. So this is an English word that takes 12 letters to spell. In Chinese, we only need two characters. Herma. Protovolstvini. I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. Um, so this is a Russian word of 17 letters. And again, in Chinese, Shiping, two characters. Green fry for director. So this is an Irish word of 21 letters. And in Chinese, Sheing. So what can I say? Chinese is a very concise language. And while we're on the subject of letters, those on ancient Greek stone inscriptions used to be sans serif, but later stone cutters tended to spread the ends of the letters out into serifs. Now in the Middle Ages, scribes and copyists based their writings off of these stone inscriptions. And the letter forms evolved because the writing was done with pens instead of chisels. And various writing styles emerged from Carolinian minuscules to the various Gothic hands. And those in turn served as inspiration for type designers and punch cutters doing printing. And although it seems like there are many type classifications, we have what, old styles, transitionals, humanist, geometrics, Latin-based scripts can broadly be classified into two big categories of serifs and sans serifs. Chinese characters also changed a lot since their origins. It's just that Chinese writing went through the entire process of development and evolution way earlier than Europe. The key implement in Chinese writing is the brush. Calligraphy was and still is one of the most highly regarded Chinese arts. Now, woodblock printing was invented in China, and the Chinese were exceptional at it, to a point where it was a contributing factor to why movable type, which was also invented in China, never really took off there. The contemporary typefaces used for Chinese print publications can broadly be classified into these families. We have Song Ti, also known as Ming Ti, 
Tai Ti, Fang Song Ti, and Hei Ti. Now, both Hei Ti and Fang Song Ti were 20th century creations. And it is not uncommon to see comparisons of Song Ti to serifs and Hei Ti to sans serifs, but I think it makes more sense for Chinese typefaces to maintain their own classifications because they're completely different from Latin alphabets anyway. Now, Chinese typefaces are extremely challenging to create, simply due to the volume of glyphs involved. Source Han Serif, which is the second pan-CJK typeface from Adobe Type, which was officially announced in April this year, was started off in 2014. So that's about three years worth of work. And they had a quite a large team working on this. The average number of glyphs for a Chinese system font clocks in at about 35,000 glyphs, give or take a few thousand. So typefaces that have enough glyph coverage to be used in body copy are usually made by foundries, like uh, founder type, monotype, because very few independent type designers have the bandwidth to create one. Songti is the standard font for body copy. And kai ti is used for runs of text that need to be differentiated from the rest of the content, like dialogues or references. Hei ti is most commonly seen in digital publishing, but recently, publishers have started to experiment with hei ti in print as well. Now, fang song ti is generally used in isolated paragraphs like quotations or highlighted sentences. There are actually a huge variety of styles, like those based off ancient scripts or brush scripts, but they fall into this general category of decorative fonts. They are used for mainly display text or short paragraphs and not so much for long form reading. A lot of articles on how to pick typefaces all tell us that, you know, typefaces, they have personalities, right? And we ought to pick typefaces based on the messaging that we want to convey. I don't disagree. It's just that very few people delve into the why. Why do these letters have human traits? Well, research has suggested that a lot of it boils down to experience with these typefaces in particular contexts. For example, for Latin-based typefaces, old styles and transitional serifs like Caslon, Garamond, and Baskerville, they're most often used in books and formal documents. So people tend to associate this, them as you know, serious and formal, right? Now, modern serifs like Dido and Bodoni, they're used in a variety of publications, but we associate them with elegance and high fashion because they're used in Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. To a certain extent, globalization has allowed some of these associations to transcend cultural and global boundaries to become recognized worldwide. To pair Chinese scripts with Latin scripts for body copy is reasonably straightforward in that you want to pick styles that present an even typographic color. In this regard, serifs would go with song ti and sans serifs would go with hei ti. In general, you'd want their strokes thickness to match up, but keep in mind that Chinese glyphs tend to appear denser than their Latin-based counterparts at the same size, so you'll need to have, make some adjustments for that. Now, language and writing have allowed human beings to communicate ideas and record history for thousands of years, and we've written things on almost everything, from cave paintings to stone engravings, from parchment to paper. Right now, the medium of our time is the screen and the browser. Our types are now font files, and we've replaced typesetting with composing sticks and font plates with CSS. So let's discuss typography on the web. We first need to understand the web as a medium. And to be fair, it's a rather young medium. But the web is nothing like we've seen before. It is a dynamic and interactive medium. And many designers, especially those who are used to having absolute control over the final presentation, may find this a bit disturbing. But the thing is, with the web, there's no longer a single final form of presentation, as multiple output devices could be used to view your content. Now, authors can only influence the presentation rather than control it. A combination of influences from various sources, like the browsers and users themselves, will determine how this final output looks like. And dependable delivery is also uncertain, as web resources are now distributed across multiple connected servers, and the possibility of any of them being unavailable is pretty significant. Although many would like to think that the web is simply print expressed on an electronic screen, it is not. The web is a unique medium on its own. Now, here is a long list of common font formats used on the web. But you may be thinking, 
Why on earth do we need so many formats? Well, here's my kind of non-technical explanation. Fonts are simply containers for glyphs, and font formats describe these glyphs. So the earliest fonts were pixel-based bitmaps, which were fine for low-resolution screens at the time, but for printing on high-resolution printers, we needed a better solution. So you either compress the bitmap glyphs, or you find an alternative rendering method. So Donald Nuth created Metafont in 1978 for the text system, which generated compressed bitmap fonts, while John Warnock, who was the founder of Adobe, came up with Postscript in 1985 and that was the very first vector font. Now, TrueType was Apple and Microsoft's answer to Adobe's font monopoly. Both companies then worked separately to improve TrueType, especially with regards to fonts for East Asian languages. And Apple came up with TrueType GX, which was later renamed Apple Advanced Typography. Now, Microsoft actually turned to Adobe, and together they came up with OpenType. So EOT is or embedded open type is Microsoft's proprietary standard, which is a compact form of open type fonts for use on web pages. Now, although they tried to submit this as a W3C recommendation, it was rejected in favor of WOF, which is web open font format. Now, WOF was quite the industry standard because it involved Microsoft, Mozilla, and Opera. And those of us who have worked on projects with self-hosted fonts would have probably used something called the font face rule, where we declare a list of different font formats in the hopes that our fonts will show up correctly in as many browsers as possible. Now, the number of font formats we need to declare has decreased over the years, and right now, you can pretty much get away with just declaring WOF and WOF2. So it is recommended that you declare your Latin-based font choice first because order does matter. It is almost a given that C a CJK font will have support for Latin characters, but not the other way around, right? So declaring those fonts first will result in the Latin characters being displayed in the Chinese font, and sometimes this doesn't look too great on Windows. And even though Fonts Level 3 states that user agents must match font names case insensitively, it's still recommended to put them in quotes, you know, just in case. <laughs> Not counting the font shorthand, there are six basic font properties, and the last two were introduced in Fonts Level 3. So I'll quickly run through the first four. Now, font weight is for indicating the strong thickness of your font, and it can take values from 100 to 900, or keywords like bolder or lighter. Now, font stretch is used to select fonts based on their widths, ranging from condensed to expanded. Font style allows for selection of it italic or oblique fonts. Now, italics are cursive, while obliques are actually like sloped versions of the regular face. Font size indicates the desired height of the glyphs. And we can use absolute values like pixels or m's. We can use relative values like viewport units or percentages. Or we can also use keywords like larger and smaller. Now, font size adjust was actually put in to address legibility issues. Now, faces with low X heights may be seen as less legible, especially when they're triggered as a fallback font. So what this property does is that it will adjust the font size of your fallback font so that the X height matches that of the first choice font. Font synthesis now was put in to address the issue of full italics and full bolts. You know, sometimes when the system you're using doesn't have the italic version or a heavier version of a particular font, but your browser wants to mimic those fonts. The result doesn't look very good at all. So what you can do is you can set the value of this property to none so that the browser won't do that. The font face rule allows us to use fonts beyond those available on a given platform by linking to those font files. So these font files could either be locally available or from an external source. And each rule will specify the characteristics of a single font within a family. These fonts will only be loaded when they're required, and multiple font face rules can be used to build up an entire font family. So it consists of the font face keyword, plus a bunch of font descriptors. Now, font descriptors and CSS properties, they're actually not the same thing. So this 
is how a font face rule looks like. And I don't think most people actually read through the CSS specification like they would a novel. So it's perfectly fine if this looks excessively complicated to you. Even though there's a whole lot of stuff in here, only the font family descriptor and the source descriptor are mandatory. So if either of them are absent, the entire rule is just ignored. Now, the font family descriptor is simply a label we reference in later CSS declarations. So if you're using a font like, say, Fudiger, you can actually label it like Pelmini, and it would still work. The source descriptor is a comma-separated list of external references or locally info installed font names. So it's made up of the declaration of the font file's location and an optional font hint. Now, if the browser doesn't support a particular font format stated in the hint, the font file won't be loaded. So the next three descriptors for font style, weight, and stretch are used to match styles to a particular typeface in later declarations. Again, they are descriptors. So technically, you could assign a black typeface to a font weight of 100 and proceed to confuse your entire team who cannot, cannot just figure out why setting a weight of 100 gives them this massively bold typeface. Please don't do that. Every Unicode character is represented by a unique code point. So the Unicode range descriptor allows us to specify individual code points or a range of code points for characters we want displayed using a particular font face. And we can make use of this to create custom font families with glyphs from different typefaces. So my slides, they use this font called Magnetic Pro, but they don't support Kyrillic alphabets. Fortunately, I managed to find a reasonably similar font called Bender. Now, I only need the Kyrillic letters to display in Bender, while everything else should use Magnetic Pro. So the code points in the Unicode range descriptor are that of the Kyrillic letters that I've used in this presentation. Now, say I have a page that uses only English words. Bender will not load at all because it is not needed. It will only load when the browser encounters the Kyrillic letters in the Unicode range I specified. Font feature properties were introduced in fonts level three. And earlier when I talked about all the different font formats, I mentioned that Apple and Microsoft worked to improve the original implementation of TrueType. So OpenType and Apple Advanced Topography are what we term as modern font technologies. And they can contain a lot more glyphs than previous font formats. So we can now utilize a variety of typographic features like swashes, ligatures, old style numerals, and so on. The original font variant property that could only be used to trigger small caps were also expanded a great deal. Because there's so many properties available, each with lots of different values, I'm just going to do a general overview. So some of you may be wondering, What's the point? Why do we need all these typographic features, right? Well, they're part and parcel of good typography, which is necessary to hold your reader's attention. The written word is a transference of speech, something that is heard into something visual, which is seen. So good speakers will vary their cadence, they will use gestures, you know, they will emphasize certain words. Typographic features like small caps, correct use of italics, punctuation, they do the same for text. And then other features like old style numerals, like ligatures, they help maintain a typographic color which make reading more comfortable. So these are the features that you can turn on via CSS. But note that the font you're using must have these features to begin with. And this lot, this lot up here, these are the features most often mentioned in web typography talks. Now, few people ever talk about font variant East Asian. But what this property does is it allows for glyph substitution and positioning in East Asian text. For the benefit of the audience who can't read Han characters, it might seem like all these languages share the same glyphs, but actually, it depends. Han unification involves assigning the same code point to different glyphs. And it has been quite a controversial issue, but essentially, the same code point can have variant glyphs depending on the language being used. For example, you have simplified Chinese glyphs versus traditional Chinese glyphs. Now, Japanese glyphs have their own classification known as JIS, or Japanese Industrial Standard. And they also have alternative glyphs for the same character. So this property allows us to toggle these different variant glyphs. Now, the font language override property controls the rendering of language-specific glyphs in the typeface being used. A commonly raised use case is that of common ligatures, for example, the FI ligature. So the Turkish alphabet has both a dotless 
and a dotted I. So the FI ligature should never be used. So maybe a typeface doesn't recognize a lesser known language like the Azuri language, which like the Turkish alphabet also has a dotless I. So when you use the font language overwrite property, you can force usage of the Turkish glyphs instead. Font feature settings allow us to toggle very specific open type properties. Last I checked, there were 141 open type feature tags that cover things like vertical kerning, unicase, scientific inferiors, and so on. Now, browser support for each of these different properties varies at the moment, with Firefox being the only browser that has supported everything since version 34. Now, font feature settings, on the other hand, has pretty good support across all browsers. So the specification recommends that you use the respective font variant properties over the font feature settings property. But until browser support becomes more robust, I think we'll continue to see people using this property instead. Now, if you're building a non-Chinese website, things are pretty straightforward. You can choose to serve your own font files, or you can use an online service. And for online services, the most well-known free one is Google Fonts. And then we also have paid services like Adobe TypeKit or Hoffler & Co's Cloud Topography. Broadly speaking, how TypeKit works is that you create font kits, which are registered to specific domains. And you then add fonts to these kits. TypeKit will then generate some JavaScript that you need to embed on your site, and then you apply the relevant CSS classes to get the fonts to show up. Now, TypeKit does offer a selection of free fonts as well, and their notable Chinese fonts are Source Han Sans and Source Han Serif. But if you want the entire set of Chinese fonts available, there are several font hosting services out there. Just Font is a pioneer web hosting service out of Taipei, but they do more than just host fonts. They also have typography workshops and events, and they have a really great type design blog. And out of chi mainland China, we have Youzuku, which comes up of Shanghai, that offers various methods of implementing fonts on your website. You can actually do it via CSS, like how you would on Google Fonts, or you could load the files via JavaScript. Now, they also offer SDK support for Java, PHP, Node.js. The documentation is pretty good, but it's all in Chinese, <laughs> unfortunately. Now, type foundries have gotten into the game as well. So Dynacom, where are the guys who made Pingfang, Li Song Pro, and a, a number of other Chinese fonts that actually ship with Mac OS. Their service is known as Dynafont Online. Now, Arthic Technology is the company that made the fonts found on Ubuntu, and they have their own service called iPhone Cloud. But at the end of the day, we need to keep in mind that CJK fonts clock in on the megabyte scale. So the font hosting services, they do offer optimizations like lazy loading and dynamic subsetting. So hopefully that helps. But if you want to serve your own fonts, there are also ways that you can reduce the size of your font files. So if I'm building a non-Chinese website, I always turn to Font Squirrel to generate my web fonts because subsetting. Now, Font Squirrel's web font generator allows for a very granular level of customization that I haven't seen in other tools. And there's also a desktop application for Mac called Font Prep that does the same thing. Font Spider is an open source command line tool that offers smart web font compression and conversion. This is particularly ap applicable for Chinese websites because they uh, give you the ability to subset fonts based on the glyphs being used on your site. And somehow, it seems like these companies, they like to use animals for branding. I don't know why. It's, it just is. But if you're really concerned about speed and page weight, you can simply you choose not to use any web fonts at all. Because honestly, I think system fonts that are shipped with the newer OSs are getting much better. So personally, I use a hybrid technique where my body text is set in a system font, but for the big titles and you know the display text, where there's a limited number of characters I know will not really change over time, I will actually generate web fonts containing only those glyphs. So the final font file size is a lot smaller than if I just loaded the entire character set. OK, so this, this may look irrelevant, but this is a quote by Bruce Lee, which I feel is really suitable for the web. Rather than trying to wrangle every pixel into place, we need to embrace the fact that content is meant to flow. So if you try to make it fixed, like freezing water into ice, it's not going to fit into all the different screens that people are going to try to use to view your content. So responsive websites are often mentioned in the same breath as media queries, the conditional rule that allows us to create different layouts and different screen widths. And often people use frameworks to help them build responsive websites, and I can understand why. Maybe they're not familiar with CSS, or they're short of time, or they mean they just don't like CSS in general, right? But frameworks are quite prescriptive, and that's how we end up with a lot of websites that utilize very similar layouts. 
But CSS layout has become much more mature since it first began. I mean, there's never been a specification that was created specifically for layout until Flexbox and Grid came along. And that's fantastic. We have a lot of CSS properties on our, at our disposal now, around 496 CSS properties the last time I checked. And it's up to us to combine and implement them creatively. So late last year, I had a thought while riding home on my bicycle after work. I wondered, how hard would it be to create, to typeset Chinese text on the web, like the novels and comic books I used to read when I was a kid? And that's how I discovered a, a CSS property known as writing mode. Now, there's an entire specification dedicated to writing modes, and it's defined as such support for international writing systems. So coverage includes left to right languages as well, but the writing mode property specifically addresses vertical writing. So you might, you can literally turn the browser on its side. And some, some of you might be thinking, you know, big deal. We can do that with CSS transforms, right? It's different. Let's cover some basic terminology. So inline base direction, which is indicated by the blue arrow up there, it's the direction that content is ordered on a line. It defines where the line starts and where it ends. Then the green arrow actually indicates the block flow direction. So this is the direction which block level boxes stack and the direction of this stacking in its container. So the writing mode property will dictate, dictate the block flow direction. So in this case, this is the standard default value of horizontal TB. And this is when vertical RLR and vertical RL are applied respectively. So you see that the block flow direction is now horizontal while the base, inline base direction is vertical. And then we have the orientation of the individual glyphs themselves. So every writing system has one or more native orientations. For example, Latin, Latin scripts and Arabic scripts, they are horizontal. Now, Mongolian is vertical only, while Han and Japanese kana, they're bi-orientational. So all the glyphs are actually assigned a horizontal orientation by default. And the user agent will transform the text from this horizontal default when they have to lay it out vertically. So how this works is you can either rotate, the browser can either rotate the text or transform the text. So scripts that have native vertical orientations will have an intrinsic bi-orientational transform. So regardless of whether Chinese text is laid out horizontally or vertically, the glyphs will transform and always be upright. But for Latin-based scripts, the word just rotates. But you can always set the direction of the glyph sideways or upright using a text orientation property. So this is what happens to your text when different values of writing mode are applied. These examples look correct because I'm using Firefox at the moment, but the last two examples have actually been deferred to writing modes level four, so you probably won't be able to see them in any other browsers anytime soon. And for text orientation, the initial value is mixed, but you can make all the characters upright or sideways. Another property I want to cover is text combined upright, and this addresses the issue of numerals and abbreviations in vertical text. So a very common use case for this is dates, especially in Taiwan, where they use a Ming Guo calendar. So this property allows us to fit all the digits into the width of one character and display them upright. No browser actually supports the digits value yet, which actually dictates how many digits you can squeeze into that space. So right now, we only have the all property, which Technically, there's no limit. So if you tried to put in a word there like hippopotamus, it would just look horribly squished. Now, because the East Asian composition is quite different from Western composition, we actually have a separate document that describes how to typeset text. Uh, for East Asian documents on the web. And based on this document and some of my personal experimentation, I settled onto a few typographic conventions when I'm setting Chinese text. So the first one is to use the appropriate font. So for example, Source Han Serif has fonts for four different languages, simplified Chinese, traditional Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, and you have to pick the right one because the glyphs are actually different. And this one I mentioned earlier, that Chinese characters are denser than the, their Latin-based counterparts, so you would want to bump up the font size a bit because reading small characters on a screen is not a pleasant experience. Now, for line height, there's actually a magic number that lies between 1.5 and 2, so 1.7 is a pretty good choice because this gives your text an e a better typographic color and makes it easier to read. Now, every Chinese character takes up an e same height and width because they're squares, right? So you can actually make use of text align justify to make sure everything lines up neatly. Now, for Chinese characters, in, in contrast to Latin-based characters where the recommended length is 45 to 75 characters, 
25 to 35 is more suitable because of how dense our characters are. And for print books, the start of a new paragraph is indicated by a two-character indent, but on the web, it's actually nicer to have a spaces between paragraphs. So you just want to set a margin bottom to differentiate your different paragraphs. Now, anyway, I think it's safe to conclude that typesetting Chinese text for a vertical layout is very doable on the web today. And this was the first vertical Chinese layout that I built just to learn about the properties and you know, figure out how box alignment will work and stuff. And here are some insights that I gleaned. As I mentioned earlier, 25 to 35 characters is a pretty reasonable length, and that's done by clamping the height of the content block. Because Chinese characters are squares, it also means that if you set a height of 25 m's, it gives you 25 characters per line. Now, to vertically center this content block, we can actually set the top and bottom margins to auto, which is something that we always wanted to do for vertical writing, but we, nev we, we couldn't really do it. But if you are trying to center things horizontally with vertical text, it's even more painful. Just saying. Now, these directions of top, right, bottom, left start to get a bit confusing when you have rotated Latin text. Because say you have this header, and you want some extra spacing between the header and the paragraph. Do you set the margin on the bottom? or on the left. It's actually the left. So that's why we have this CSS logical property specification, which introduces new CSS properties that are flow relative equivalents of the physical blocks model properties. So properties like these use block start and block end, or inline start and inline end, instead of left and right. So this specification is still in working draft status, but I'm very excited to see it developed and implemented. So right now you can see that support is kind of limited. So for my experiment, I also put in a writing mode switcher to toggle between vertical and horizontal text because I felt like it, right? The tricky part was actually getting the images to display correctly because I would have loved to have a media query for writing modes that I could lay out my images according to you know, the orientation with the picture element, but that actually doesn't exist. So this is just a hack with CSS transforms. And another project I worked on was this bilingual mixed layout website. And that was quite an interesting experience. So this is a website about Penang Hokkien, which is a dialect from my hometown. And what I realized is that the ease of implementing vertical layouts actually opens up an aspect of graphic design that isn't often seen on the web at the moment. So an idea I had was to make a bookshelf style list of posts using just CSS. So this was done using writing mode and a rotation transform on the header to get the text to face in the other direction. And I've grown quite fond of using a vertical header when a page has many different sections because I think this helps break up the monotony. But I'm also aware that for Latin-based languages that are meant to be read horizontally, vertical text should still largely be decorative. So we don't want to compromise the reading experience for long-form passages. So at smaller screens, we can make use of media queries to revert to a horizontal layout that makes better use of the limited space. But conversely, there are also instances where Latin text can work on narrow screen sizes as well. Perhaps you realized that the hamburger menu was not the best UI pattern that we came up with. You can actually lay out your menu links vertically along the side edge of your site instead. And I'm sure many of you can come up with even more interesting designs that make use of vertical layouts. I also kept the switcher, which is actually a checkbox hack implementation. Now, when I built this site, Grid hadn't landed yet. So I used Flexbox for a lot of the layout. And Flexbox support is great. I mean, it has better support than border radius. But Flexbox with writing mode, not so good. I'll be honest, there are quite a, lot, there are quite a large number of cross-browser bugs that I encountered. Like on Firefox, if you don't specify a width on the element with a vertical writing mode, it actually gets kicked off the page. But does that mean that we should not use writing mode? No. In fact, there's never been a better time than now to live on the cutting edge. Evergreen browsers are a thing now, with bug fixes and new features being shipped faster than ever. Now, CSS Grid, I feel, is one of the best rollouts of a new CSS feature ever, with almost all major browsers shipping it in March this year. And right now, more than 60% of the market is using a browser that supports Grid. And here's a little secret I discovered. In fact, Patrick actually mentioned this earlier, is that by raising bugs we find when trying out new features, we are actually showing browser vendors that these features are in demand. And this works both ways. If we don't use features simply because they're buggy, browser vendors will think that nobody cares about these features, and they'll choose to fix other bugs instead. But if more of us use these features and raise the bugs we discover, it sends a signal to browser vendors that people are using these features and encourage them to address related bugs sooner rather than later. 
So here is a long list of resources I referred to when preparing this talk, and I'll share the slides for anybody who's interested. If you need inspiration for vertical layouts, the Tateyoko Web Awards site has a very nice list. Now, my friend Jen Simmons also has an experimental layout lab where she showcases all the different things that are now possible with modern CSS. And even if you don't end up using any of what I've covered today in your next project, I hope that you will keep these techniques and properties at the back of your mind. And maybe one day, when you're tired of building the same old layouts again and again, you'll reach for them and create something amazing. Spasiba. Thank you. And we have some time for questions. Yeah, sorry, I overran the time. That's all right, that's all right. <laughs> We're a friendly conference, you know? <laughs> okay. Great. Uh, right, so I, I, got, I got a number of questions from Twitter. My favorite one, I think, let me see. It's still sinking. <laughs> Those clouds. <clears throat> yeah, my, my favorite one, do you like corgi puppies? I'm sorry? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Do you like dogs in, in, in general? Puppies sound great. Puppies and kids. That's, baby, that's great. I'm totally... baby animals are fantastic. Okay, so th then that's back to topic. <laughs> <laughs> Funny fact, uh, I often see some goods from China uh, made for Russian market, uh, and they, uh, the signs of them are look suspiciously weird. <laughs> when you look closer, they are uh, Cyrillic letters are combined from Latin characters. Oh. I guess we should make a Cyrillic typography talk on CSS Conf, Conf Asia next year. Yes, to that's a wonderful idea. <laughs> that's, if our, anybody, that's our different. <laughs> if anybody wants to apply, um, I'm shouting out CSS Conf Asia is doing a call for speakers right now, so you can find it online. It's actually JS Conf Asia. So we have to talk about Cyrillic typography because they <laughs> produce a lot of goods from for, for, for Russia. So we have to exchange. <laughs> um, yeah. <clears throat> Speaking of lo localization, uh, another question from Peter: uh, Is it possible to just change text and uh, change text and fonts to Chinese and be done with it, or you have to do some other kind of adjustments for layout, maybe colors, maybe like more space or less space? How interfaces in China or in Chinese uh, language are different from like typical Western ones? I think that this is the this is why I found the writing mode property so interesting is because when the web came about, when, when we started computers, everything was English based. I mean because digital computing started in English speaking languages. So a lot of the layout, everything was, you know, horizontal. And a lot of we had actually for, for Chinese scripts, we lost a lot of the layouts that, that are traditional to us in print. But because I think internationalization is such a big thing at the W3C. They've actually worked hard to implement such things. The Unicode bidirectional algorithm is amazing because it uh, actually takes care of Hebrew scripts, which is right to left. So I think what we have now is much better than what we had before. And this may change how designs look. Because in the past, we were limited. We were forced to create layouts that adhere to a Latin-based layout. But now, we actually have the possibility of creating layouts that are even more suitable for Han characters and even Hebrew or right to left languages. And I think that's great. And in fact, even Latin, you, we can actually, it, it's not limited, like you have to use vertical text in Chinese writing only. You can do it for Latin or Cyrillic letters as well because graphic design is so creative and there's so many yeah, yeah, options that's, that's now. True. So it helps not only Chinese typography, yeah. of course. Um, do you know any other uh, uh, command line based tools for font, font subsetting? Because uh, font prep, Anton uh, saying that font prep is abandoned. Yeah. And it, it's uh, like there's no Windows no, version. No, no, there isn't. And so right now, the one that I know of is Spot Font Spider. That was, I think it's actually uh, kind of supported by Tencent. Okay. It's a really big company. I'm not, and I think Font Min, uh, so Font-Min, is another project that does font optimization. That is a command line tool as well. Both of these, I think, they are dependent on Node. Okay. Um, but so far, those are the two that I'm aware of. I, they may be more, but I think these two are the uh, more well-known names. 
Yeah. So there's a, there's an opportunity for another open source project that yes. will take care of this because there's no one go to tool yeah. no. at the moment like SVGO for optimizing SVG. Oh, yeah. Like we would, it would be great to have like some font o. Yeah, font o. That's font -o. the new name, guys. <laughs> Cyber squatted. Now, uh, what about Ruby? Is it widely used? Uh, does it help to read and write uh, Chinese? Uh, Ruby is interesting because what Ruby, if for those who are not aware, Ruby, uh, we call, sometimes when you see, um, especially textbooks or books for people learning uh, Han-based languages, you will see the glyph and then you will see like mini text like next to the glyph that explain how to pronounce these glyphs. And we call these texts Ruby. So um, in, I think it's more often used in Japanese texts where, okay. where they, actually show the pronunciation next to the text. Right now, I think there's a lot of work being done in actually how to implement it or whether it mm -hmm. should. Because if the, especially if the text, all our glyphs are squares, and if the pronunciation overruns, what are we going to do? So right oh, now, yeah. there's still a lot of debate over that. But yes, Ruby is mostly used, I would say, to help learners pronounce the words that they're learning. Yeah. OK. Uh what about uh, top to bottom uh, direction? Uh, is it something widely used, or is it is it something like unique and looks a bit weird when you like Chinese media, for example, like typical news site or something like? Would it would it uh, be uh, written horizontally or vertically? So this is interesting because mainland in mainland China, and and this has a lot of you know cultural and historical impact. But right now in mainland China, you will mostly see simplified Chinese glyphs that are typeset horizontally. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go to Hong Kong and Taiwan, they've sort of kept a, a lot of, more, of the more traditional things. So you will see tradition. They will use traditional Chinese glyphs, and you will see more books that are vertically set. And and this has you know cultural and political implications. But mm -hmm. that's the case. So if you if you're in mainland China, you'll tend to see more horizontal layouts. But if you go to Taiwan, you, you'll see newspapers, you'll see novels, you'll see books that are vertically set instead. OK, uh, just a simple question. Uh, if there is a Russian business trying to localize their, their interface, their application for Chinese audience, mm -hmm. like not, not politically Chinese, yeah, yeah. but in a, in a wider, uh, uh, what, what, what should they do? Go for horizontal or vertical or? The way Chinese characters are is that it can it, it can be read comfortably regardless of its whether it's vertical or um, horizontal. So it could be a design choice. Right. Um, I'm pretty sure, as I mentioned, I'm not sure if it's due to a constraint of technology that most of the Chinese websites we see are are horizontal. But who knows? Because now that we can do it with writing mode, you might st we might start to see more vertical. Text, especially in, in Japan, where vertical text is more common, they're actually encouraging. So there's actually an award uh, every year that, that sort of tries to pick the best vertical layouts and, and they'll oh. showcase it, which is one of the, what, the site that I showed at the very end. Uh -huh. They're actually trying to encourage more people to design vertical layouts because it's now possible. But I think most people are not aware. So they're trying to spread awareness and sort of increase the number of vertical layouts we see on the web. But I does it look like old fashioned a bit when, when it's vertical or how? But how, Metro how, how, is how? in. No, I mean, how does it feel? Yeah. It it does have a more it does have a more traditional feel, uh -huh. and um, I and I feel it it's for me personally, I think it's a good thing because the language itself was made to be was has been vertical for thousands of years. Right. This horizontal writing thing is a very recent thing, and I think it helps to to sort of hold on to a bit of our own culture by by doing because true. it's unique. You don't see it in any only East Asian languages are vertical, and I I don't want this to die out. Yeah, in the that's, modern that's age. That's great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.